my name is Katie Schmidt. I am the grounds manager and horticulturist at Dick Arboretum of the Plains. And uh, today we're going to talk about how to create um, native front front yards, uh, specifically front yards, because the problems and challenges are different for a front yard and a backyard. Um, and when I say native, we're going to talk mainly about native plants, but I'm not a purist. There are some non-natives in this presentation and you just have to decide what plants speak to you, you know, what, what your goal with this is. So let's get going. I'll try to keep it somewhat quick. Um, and just know that if I go too fast or you feel like you really want to know more, you can always, always email, um, email the Arboretum email address. I think it's arboretum at heston.edu. And you can find all of our personal emails or our work emails on the website. So please do reach out with your questions if you want to follow up. All right, here we go. Oh, it's not letting me. There we go. Okay. So just a little overview. Um, we're going to talk about kind of the problem with conventional lawns. If you're here uh, in this talk, I have a feeling that you you want to get rid of some lawn space, and you maybe already know some of the uh, troublesome statistics about uh, lawns and turf. Um, and then we will go quickly to designing the alternatives um, and just a few tips about how to design them well and how to make sure that your front yard um, you know, it's still pleasant to look at it. It doesn't need to be a prairie. It can be uh, inspired by the prairie, right? It can it can be designed and cared for and acceptable in a neighborhood. And then we'll talk about plant selection, which I could go on forever about, uh, but I just just a few favorites and some maintenance tips. So we will start with why does your yard matter? Why um, why would you want to change anything about um, your lawn? Well, um, the land use, especially in the United States, is kind of crazy the way we use land. So 40% um, of it is farmed. And that was a number from 2012. So that is probably much higher now because a lot of people are taking ground out of CRP, which means they're more likely to be crop farming it. Um, and that's a lot. That's, you know, getting up to half of the continental United States. So a place that used to be, um, full of wild spaces, right? Especially in the Great Plains, it used to be miles and miles of uninterrupted habitat, grasslands, um, oak savannas. That has all transformed. And so it is not hard to understand how species, um, big and small, large mammals, all the way down to, you know, invertebrates, insects. It's not hard to understand where they are struggling to make their way in this new kind of uh, landscape that we humans have formed by, you know, farming, largely monoculture, um, industrial type farming. Secondly, in Kansas alone, um, turf grass is one of the most irrigated crops we have. Um, in acreage, it is second to corn. We grow more turf grass, almost more turf grass than corn. Um, so it's a lot. It's a lot of turf grass. I think it's 100 and well, 150 some thousand acres of lawn and turf. So, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but turf grass doesn't really provide habitat. It doesn't do a lot for the soil. It doesn't do a lot for carbon sequestration. Doesn't hold a lot of storm water. You know, it just doesn't do much. It's just kind of a green carpet. And so if you think about how many acres that is, that is potentially wasted space, um, we could be using it better perhaps. And lastly, 80% um, of us live in the US um, in cities and incorporated areas. And so we're getting farther and farther away from the wild spaces, those meadows, those rural areas um, that is really important that people stay connected to. You know, We don't get that wilderness and that nature time. And so if we're going to live in cities, we ought to make those cities um, as vibrant and as um, colorful and as diverse planting wise as we can to kind of bring that uh, back because I don't I don't foresee there being a huge uh, mig migration of people out of cities and living back on a farm with a single cow and a single sod house. I don't see that happening. Um, so if we're going to live in a modern way, I think we can do it in a very eco friendly way and also a way that um, keeps us connected to the plants that were native to the area we're living on. 
So um, a few more statistics. Oh yeah, 157,000 acres, you'll see by that little uh, doodle there of lawns and lawn area maintained. And that was a number from 20, 2006. Think about how many more suburbs there are now than there were in 2006. And you'll see that that number also goes up. Um, so what's a lot of acres of lawn, just lawn and how much we spend um, to take care of it. A lot of people say, oh, you know, gardening is so expensive. And I think, well, I mean, it can be, but also lawns are <laughs> can get expensive. Um, it turns out to be about a, almost $1,500 per acre for us to take care of. And that's not only, I mean, that's you personally taking care of your lawn and mowing and trimming and edging. And if you fertilize, those types of things. But that's also tax dollars. I mean, we have a lot of public green space that we pay to keep in turf grass. So it's something to think about. And if you see that other pie chart there, um, just household alone, when you're looking at the total expenditure of the state on lawns, um, households were almost 33%. So you and I, you know, homeowners, people who have yards, spend a lot of money taking care of our yards and our, and our grass specifically. So um, I think maybe we could put that money to better use creating habitat. So um, I, I really, I don't know whose house this is. This is a picture from Google and I'm really worried that someday the person whose house this is is going to be in the talk I'm giving. So if this is one of you, your home is lovely. I'm not trying to bag on you. Um, but I use this house as an example because this is, if you were to drive through a neighborhood, I think what most people would agree looks like a very well-maintained, very tidy, very aesthetically pleasing landscape. Um, but that's kind of um, misleading because it's a Euro... Eurocentric idea of what beauty looks like. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but, uh, but we, what beauty looks like basically in, you know, 17th century London, you have well-shaped bushes, you have exotic looking trees and a lot of um, grass. So this habitat wise is basically a big habitat desert, right? There's kind of a food desert. The bushes up by the house, they might be able, birds might be able to build a nest in there, but honestly, they're a bit too small. They're in, in cat claw range. Um, and they're, I think they're boxwood and barberry and those aren't native. So I don't think they host any, they don't bloom and they don't really host any of our native insects. The trees are a bit too far apart to provide good cover for songbirds or flocking birds. Um, they would need to be a little bit closer together if. For, to really draw birds in and provide good habitat. And then you have this expanse of lawn that, you know, if they're not using too many chemicals on it, it might have worms and beetles, which would be good for, for birds who can forage. But if we're being honest, right? It probably is chemically treated if it's looking that green and that weed free. They're doing something uh, to, to keep it nice. And so that's probably gonna decrease the amount of usable forage and insects there. So when you break it down like that, is this really that beautiful? Is this really what our goal should be? Um, and most landscape companies today, this is what they're aiming for, uh, right? If you hire a landscape company, this is what they're aiming for. So we just need to maybe rethink why we think this is beautiful. Why, why is this our goal? Because it's having a toll, right? times that by millions and millions and millions of homes and subdivisions with lawns and exotic bushes and shrubs and trees. And you get a really big problem. And that problem is that there's nowhere for um, the world's insects to live and reproduce and feed. Um, because these bushes that are from Japan and Korea and Russia and you know, the Kazakhstan, they're very lovely to look at. And I love a good specimen plant. But if that's by and large what you have in your landscape, um, it, it can't be used by the, thing, by the animals that evolved here in the Great Plains. They evolved with our plants. And so we've seen a huge decrease in um, populations. And this is worldwide. This study was done um, in Germany and Western Europe, but the trends over the past couple of years have been pretty much global in that um, 
not only moths and butterflies, the lep Lepidoptera line you see there, but all other invertebrates. That includes flies and beetles and some of, some of the less charismatic bugs, should I say. Uh, they're seeing huge declines, population declines. Um, and some of the most common ones, the lightning bug. Um, you could do some pretty sad reading about the decline and the plight of the lightning bug uh, because lightning bugs need leaf litter and Americans tend to compulsively rake it up and bag it up. And if you don't have leaf litter, you can't have lightning bug reproducing. So um, it's a big problem. And take that one small story about lightning bugs and times it by all the different species with all their different needs, we have a really big issue. And uh, you know, you might be thinking, well, I don't love bugs. A few less mosquitoes would be okay with me. But 60% of birds rely on invertebrates for food and 80% of wild plants rely on them for pollination. So if we have a decline in insects, um, it's really a short matter of time before we see a decline in the mammals that depend on them and then the humans that depend on them. So um, it's a really good reminder that these small things, uh, they make the world go round. Insects are the linchpins of the ecosystem. And if we don't take care of them eventually, we are going to feel the effects. So where do we get this idea? The science tells us, you know, you can't, we can't live like this. We can't keep expanding cities and subdivisions and having these non-native plants in these places. Um, but we keep doing it. <laughs> but the science says no, so why do we do it? And it is cultural, folks. Um, lawns are paradoxically kind of a very American thing, but they, they're an idea from an old world. Um, when, when some of the first European people came here, we decided, hey, uh, I came from a place where I was a peasant under, the, under aristocratic rule. And we looked up to those folks who had money and power. And as much as we might have disliked them, they had lawns because that was a sign of wealth and status back in those middle ages and then up through the 17th and 18th century. Uh, so we decided, well, we're gonna make this new country and um, we're gonna take it from people who are already here. We could do a whole talk about that. And then we're going to change the way it looks to make it look like the place we came from. So this is kind of an old holdover from the idea that if you have money and power and you're a landowner, which was a big deal when people got here, right? To be able to free yourself from serfdom and come here and to own land uh, was a big deal. And landowners have lawns. And of course, through the 50s, when the advent um, of the affordable and popular lawnmower came, oh, well then, that's a recipe for everybody in the Midwest to have a lawn. Uh, but it started quite early, um, the psychology of the lawn. But our idea of public and private green space really doesn't belong on this continent, right? It is modeled after a European, um, a European culture, and it's also modeled after their climate. They get a lot more rain, especially if you're talking about Scotland and England. Um, it's quite moist there, and you can grow a lot of grass, and you can have sheep cut that grass. But that's just, I don't have sheep in my front lawn cutting my lawn, and most of you probably don't either. So it's odd then that all over the United States, we hold on to this idea of beauty and tidiness and, um, and wealthy city living uh, as looking like an old London manor house. It's very strange. So I am here to tell that story and ho hopefully help you break out of that. And let's do something that looks like where we live, right? because those lawns don't look like Kansas. These photos look a lot more like Kansas in the Great Plains. So um, hopefully we can find an alternative. Native plants and native plant communities are a great alternative to this weird um, idea of beauty. We can still have something that's very beautiful, uh, but that fits our place and creates a sense of place with where we actually live, uh, which is on the plains. And so, these plants are suited to our weather climate. They're suited to our harsh winters and our crazy hot summers. Um, and so, of course, they don't take as much, they don't take as much babying, right, as your turf grass lawn. Um, and they also actually serve the environment around them. They provide seed and food and shelter 
they sequester a lot of carbon because they have those deep, deep root systems. Um, your fescue lawn probably has a root system anywhere from six to 12 inches. And um, a single lead plant, say a prairie lead plant can have a root system over 10 feet. So it puts a lot of wonderful organic matter into the soil. And as you can imagine, it aerates as it grows down, as it grows down and dies and it allows storm water to sink in. I mean, it just does so much under the ground that you don't even see. And so planting these native communities can really make a difference um, in many different aspects when you're thinking about, you know, something that's environmentally friendly from the soil all the way to the air quality. Um, densely planted native gardens can do a lot and they provide a lot of beauty while they do it. So surely there's a balance, right? Um, what is good in terms of eco-friendly, um, something that is sustainable and water wise, right? Is often looking kind of disorderly and what is neat and acceptable in your neighborhood maybe um, is often unsustainable. So surely there's a balance. And that's a quote from a great book that I just love um, by Claudia West and um, Thomas Rainier. I highly recommend it. Um, but they talk a lot about striking the balance between using native plants, but using them in patterns, clusters, and very specific ways to make sure that the, the landscape that you're creating is interpreted as purposeful and intentional and organized. That doesn't mean it has to be in perfect rows or it has to be perfectly orderly, but it has some inherent logic and organization. Because when you look out on a prairie, it is beautiful in its own right, but it doesn't have a pattern or um, an inherent organization. It is random, it is natural, um, which looks great on a large scale, but on a small scale, like in your front yard, it doesn't have the same awe-inspiring effect. It often just looks like who didn't mow, you know, like we have that idea that it needs to look cared for. So I will give you some tips on how to do that. The first tip is about framing. Um, I talk about this a lot, a lot. I can't talk about it enough because framing can make a very diverse, very ecologically friendly, pollinator friendly, bird feeding garden. Um, that garden looks messy. A good frame can make it look totally purposeful and organized. And so you want to make sure that um, the people walking by, because we are talking about your front yard, so I assume that you're maybe living in a city, somebody's going to see it. They're going to drive by, walk by, see it from the road. Um, you have to have a cue to them that this is intentional and that it, it has a plan. Because people, uh, we, are, we are funny creatures, and we often kind of harken back to our primal instinct. And um, this, this paper by um, Joan Nassauer, she goes into some interesting detail about why people maybe don't like things that are very tall or things that look too wild. And it's because long ago when, when humans were living in nomadic tribes, right? And we were worried about getting attacked by another tribe or attacked by a bear or you know a large animal. If you were in a place where the, the vegetation was close to your eye line, you were in danger because you could not run away and you could not see something approaching you. And so even though it has been a long, <laughs> that many thousands of years since I think most people have worried about getting attacked on a daily basis by an animal um, or a neighboring tribe, we still have that in our little brains way back in our primal brains. And so sometimes when you walk into an uncared for landscape that is quite tall, you can get an uncomfortable feeling that subconsciously it's your body telling you, maybe you aren't safe here. Maybe this place is too wild, right? And you need to go back to a safer place. So her thought was, if you introduce obvious cues to the people who are experiencing, interacting with and passing by this landscape, they can better appreciate the ecological value because they feel safe. They understand where, where they're supposed to walk and where they're not supposed to walk. And they understand what, he, what the human impact here is. So what's great about this photo, it illustrates 
straight lines, right? There's lots of grasses here. It's quite tall, it's quite dense. Um, and there's lots of different plants, different species in here. But the straight line clearly tells me that this is intentional. This stuff didn't just grow up here, right? Somebody put it there and I can tell because there's a, there's a clean sidewalk, there's groomed edges. You know, this is intentional and inviting to me. So we'll see some more examples of that. So this is, I think it's probably somebody's back deck area, but this is a really dense, maybe even a per reconstruction. I would say has very little inherent organization. Very, I, you know, I wouldn't want to go tromping through there barefoot. It's kind of intimidating, but that really nice mown edge tells me exactly where I'm supposed to be. And it also tells me that this is cared for. Somebody's clearly manicuring this to my, you know, subconscious European standard. And it makes it all the more inviting and really looks nice to me. So that's just somebody keeping a nice clean edge. So clean lines. And here's another great example. This is obviously a botanical garden somewhere, but you see how busy and messy that garden is. Everything's falling over the sidewalk and it's falling everywhere. And there's really not even a color scheme. It's very wild, but it is surrounded by order, right? On the front side, it is surrounded by a very, very straight sidewalk, right? Very straight and well-edged, not, not scruffy in any way. And then on the back side, you see all those hedges. They're made into those very cool trapezoids, right? So you're framing something that's quite dense and maybe a bit busy to the eye, maybe a bit gaudy or messy or full. You're framing it with order. Um, and that is such a clever, they're doing it really well here and that it just always works and it always works well to have a nice clean edge. And for our purposes, I mean, I wish this were my yard, but I'm thinking more in terms of a nice steel edging or pavers or bricks or, you know, making sure your curb is always nicely edged with your string trimmer. Something that tells people that this garden of yours has a purpose and somebody's doing it on purpose. So here are some front yards um, that I really like as example yards because they are quite full. Um, they're, they're using a specific color palette which we'll talk about a little bit later, but you know, in this top one, they're using a lot of light green, a lot of greens, playing with different greens, chartreuse green, kind of sea from gray green or teal, and then a true green. So you can kind of play with color there, but you also see there's a little bit of lawn. So this is somebody who took part of their lawn and converted it to a garden, but left some, right? And that's kind of what I've done at my house. I always have to have lawn because I have a dog and my dog loves Frisbee. So we have to have lawn for Frisbee, but I keep kind of chipping away at taking more and more out of lawn and putting it into a useful, more interesting and pollinator friendly garden beds. This one down here shows how you can use uh, different media. Like you can juxtapose mulch with maybe a swoop of decorative rock or river rock or pebbles. And you know, you don't even have to have much planted in there, maybe a few succulents even, to have it make an interesting impact and kind of a statement. It can be artful and it can be a little bit abstract. Um, and so think also think about some of those hardscape elements that you could use to create your native front yard. So here's, um, this is a design that I think was on a newsletter a few years ago. We often do these, these designs um, and you'll see here, now this is not a front yard. It could be depending on the shape of your front yard. Um, but you'll just see here that I, I created an edge all the way around it with grass. Um, and with the same grass all the way around the front and sides and with a little bit of a taller one in the back. But I kind of hemmed it in, right? Surrounded it with one thing. So it was very clear that this is, these are the boundaries. Um, and so you could even go one step further and put, you know, hem it in with one species of plant and then put pavers around or then put edging or something. But boundaries are really important if you're going to do a dense, um, heavily planted area. And then also notice that I, I designed it in clusters. So it's not one plant here and just one over there. Most of the plants are in groups of three to five because um, you want to make a statement when they bloom and prairie plants especially can be understated. 
And so unless you have a few together, you can't always get that wow factor. And also by clustering, that's another way to show that this is not just natural seed broadcast out. There's a plan, there is structure to this, and it is meant to have a certain pattern. So clustering is important. Um, it's more fun when they bloom for you, and it also helps people try to understand what you're doing. Now, you can have a specimen plant. I love that, just a single specimen. Um, but you just have to think carefully about what that is and why that is. Is it the foliage color? Is it the bloom? Is it the shape of the plant? Um, but try not to have too many specimens is my design advice because it tends to start looking like just one of everything, a little bit random. I always tell people it's fine to do one of everything, but think about um, design wise, if you just painted every wall in your house a different color, um, it would be fun. And some people would love it. But after a while, you might think, hmm, it's a bit much. I can't enjoy any one color because I'm being bombarded. So design-wise, you want a cluster. And you also want to think about, um, yeah, color. Oh, so we do want to talk a little bit about site prep. Um, so so you want to think about your design, but you the steps are, I wonder if I can go back. So you, you prep, and then you design, and then you maintain. So the prep um, is the part we're going to talk about now. Um, so there's a couple options. So chemical control is an obvious option. If you're planting in, ex in existing turf grass, kind of depends on what your situation is. If you have Bermuda, right, that is really difficult, that is really hardy, um, that might be a time for chemical control. Or if you have all tons of bindweed, that's just going to come back after you pull it. Now, this is not my favorite method. Um, but honestly, none of the, <laughs> no method is great. They all have their pros and cons. So chemical control, you could you can do like a homemade vinegar mix. There's lots of good ones on the internet. I would avoid the ones that include a lot of salt because salt in the soil is also not good. Um, and it tends to make the soil too salty and that doesn't leach out as fast as it needs to, especially if you're doing multiple applications. And with the vinegar salt mixture, you have to do multiple applications. So be, be aware of that, but the vinegar um, can kill weeds. Um, and after multiple applications, it can really it can really do a good job. Roundup is an obvious one. Um, it tends to kill after just one or two applications. The benefit of Roundup is that um, you don't disturb the soil um, because tilling it up, while it may kill what you have there, you stir up new seeds that were in the seed bank and you expose them to air and light and so they germinate. Um, so Roundup allows you to not disturb the soil at all, kill what is there, wait the allotted time and then plant right into that dead turf. Um, and that's actually what I did at my house and it has worked out really well. Um, but the other non no chemical option is solarization. So if you plan ahead, you can um, use plastic, clear plastic, white plastic. Don't use black plastic. It doesn't tend to let enough light in and you have to have light. Um, but you basically clear an area, put plastic down, allow the sun to beat on that plastic and heat up the soil. It also allows the sun to germinate any weed seeds that are there. They will germinate and then die because it gets so hot and so dry under that plastic. So solarization, um, is a non-chemical way to do it. I'm not going to call it an earth-friendly way. It's probably earth-friendlier than spraying with chemicals, but it's pretty hard on the soil microbes and the invertebrates um, that, that were there. They, they come back after solarization, but um, it's not without its cons. You can also solarize with cardboard. I actually think some of our staff at the Arboretum have tried that and just like smothering basically using cardboard and newspaper and other types of recycling scraps over the course of a season to just smother any growth that's there. That's another option. Definitely look that up. I use cardboard mulch a lot um, at the Arboretum and it's very nice uh, because it's something we have a lot of. And then the third option is mechanical approach, right? Um, we, we, know, we know of a fella uh, that we've done some landscape work for who killed his Bermuda grass lawn by multiple rounds of tilling and turning with a shovel because especially Bermuda is very shallow rooted, really only about six inches. Um, and tilling it over and over again and then pulling the kind of Bermuda strands out of the soil 
letting that settle, tilling it again, and then every time it greens up, getting after it. Um, that requires a lot of diligence and patience. And if you have it, that can work. <laughs> that can work for certain situations. Um, but again, anytime you're tilling the soil that much, you do lose some of the soil integrity. Um, you have can have erosion problems. You can have a breakdown in, um, in, in the natural shape, the clumps of your soil, kind of depending whether you have a clay or loam mix. So Again, too much tillage also drives invertebrates away. Um, so you have to find what works for you. And I'm not an advocate for any one of these things. I think everyone has a different situation. Um, so what works for one is going to work is not going to work for another. And if you want to know what's maybe best for you and you don't know, you can sign up for a consultation uh, and one of us can come out and maybe give you some advice on that. So we'll go to design. We talked a little bit about design, you know, clean lines. Um, can help people understand what you're doing. Clustering can also help. But when it comes right down to designing, as in what plants do you choose? Um, one of the easiest ways by color. And we just have to remember that the rule is that high plant diversity, that means lots of different species, is going to look better aesthetically in fewer colors. Um, and, and you do want diversity because a prairie sometimes you know and if you were to throw out a hula hoop in your front yard you may only find two or three species you might have grass you might have a dandelion you might have some henbit if you're me or some creeping veronica two or three species of things right but if you were to do that in a healthy prairie you might find 20 or 30 or more 50 species you know per square yard um within that hula hoop so High diversity is good, and that tends to be the natural order of a healthy environment. So we want to mimic that on a much smaller scale. So please don't plant 50 species per square yard. But, but do think about how can I fit in a diverse array of forbs that bloom all season long, that provide color and foliage and nuts and berries and seeds and pollen, you know, and nectar. That starts to add up when you want all those things. So you high diversity is good but keep it in a contained color palette if you're worried about aesthetics. Um, so like a good example is this photo here. You have lavender, you have some um, Mediterranean gray Santalina there with the, with the really gray leaves. And it looks like some Coreopsis. Okay, that's fine. This is a kind of a non-native low growing ground cover situation. So if I wanted to come in and add diversity to that, but I didn't want to clutter it, right? I didn't want to make it look messier or too gaudy or too busy. I maybe could add iris if I wasn't concerned about natives. I might say, okay, I want to add some iris. I want to add some early spring color, something that smells nice, but it has purple and yellow. So I could add a lot of iris and it wouldn't change the color palette and it would still look pretty good. I could also add blue-eyed grass. Now this is a lovely um, sort of part shade, part sun native. Um, and we also have the white-eyed grass, which is um, Cisrinchium angustifolium. So we have both the blue and the white. And this will fit right in. It's, it's low growing. It has that purple yellow color palette. And so you could add a lot of that and it, you, it would just blend in nicely. And lastly, you could also put in um, during evening primrose. Again, it has a similar growth habit. It's pretty low, kind of trailing. So it would mix in with that um, gray Santalina. And that one's going to bloom early, early spring and provide some early spring nectar. So you can kind of stretch that useful season of your garden um, with these plants. But you could add all these and not really have to worry too much about really design principles or, you know, stealing the focus from one area or another because they all fit within that color palette. So maybe based on the color of your house or your favorite colors, choose two or three, right? Or up to four maybe, and then stick with those by and large. And then you can use those specimen plants, those single plants over here and there to pop away from that, you know? So maybe if your colors are blue and, um, chartreuse green and yellow, right? Some contrast. It's okay to have a red thing every now and then if you love red. 
but you just have to think about the color wheel and what is complementary, what is opposite. Um, so that's why purple and yellow look so good together and you know, blue and yellows, blues and oranges. Um, you have to think about what's opposite on the color wheel, what looks good, and then just keep it to a simple palette. And then you don't have to worry so much about um, all these other frivolous design rules. Just don't make it too busy. So here's a great example of this principle in action at the Arboretum. Um, this is a very dense, very busy garden we have, um, but it really is sticking to a pretty confined palette. It's um, shades of purple and shades of yellow. So there's light purple, dark purple, almost bluish purple, um, and there's orange yellow and neon yellow and almost white. Um, and so you're, we're kind of working within tones and hues of the same colors. And so it works well. And what we managed to shove in a lot of different species in here. Um, and then there is an accent in there. There is some dark red. There is some, some right there in the middle of the photo, there's pincushion flower, just those flashes of burgundy, which is fine. It, it's a nice little, it's a nice little touch here and there. But if we had all that red and then a different shade of red, and then um, a bunch of, you know, a bunch of different colors, maybe some bright orange, it would start to get a little bit overwhelming to the eye. So as you're thinking about design, um, of course, the reason you're here is probably because you want to create habitat. And so if we're thinking about habitat for birds um, or small mammals, um, often with yards, it's birds, people want to attract more birds, you have to have insects. Um, so we, I have a slide later about um, plants, especially for birds, nut things that produce nuts berries and seeds right but 96 percent of terrestrial birds need insects to feed their babies so if you want them to nest near you and if you want them to successfully rear young and increase the population you need bugs and all kinds of bugs everything from flies to beetles to worms to caterpillars um, and so obviously a great way to do that is to start by not using any pesticides and just trying to let uh, live and let be uh, when it comes to something maybe nibbling on your plants. You have to remember that that's natural and especially for prairie plants, they have evolved to be nibbled on. That is normal and it's okay. Um, and then secondly, you can choose the right plants to make sure you're attracting those insects. Yeah. Um, and so the, the first thing you can do is think about host plants. So a host plant, um, is something that basically it hosts a caterpillar. A caterpillar can live on it. And um, a plant, it's a plant on which a very specific organism lives. So a great example of this is that um, we all know monarchs need milkweed, right? The adult butterfly can feed on many different flowers, but the caterpillar stage of that butterfly can only eat milkweed. Um, so that, that's a host plant. Then milkweed is the host plant for the monarch butterfly. But what people don't know is many, many butterflies and moths have a host plant. It's not just monarchs. So there's lots of great plants to choose from that can bring in caterpillars, which are just fun on their own. Caterpillars are great fun to watch grow, um, but they'll bring in the birds. Too. So you want to make sure you're providing host plants when you're designing your native front yard. Think about what you can provide in terms of host plant and, you know, food for uh, the critters that are living near you. And Lenora Larson, who is sort of the host plant guru out of Kansas City, look her up. She's a genius. Um, but she has a great saying, and it is that if you have a pollinator garden that just uh, provides nectar and pollen and doesn't have host plants, then what you created is actually like a nightclub where, um, where all of the adult butterflies mix and mingle and they have their adult beverages, uh, but there's no place for the babies. It's no place for children, right? So you have to have host plants included if you want to really provide habitat because that's where the, the eggs are being laid. That's where the caterpillars are feeding and growing and uh, turning into the future butterflies. So like I said, um, milkweed is very popular right now because people are starting to understand the migratory problems that the monarch is facing. There's not enough milkweed for them to lay eggs and keep going on their journey north and south from Canada to Mexico. But what people don't know is that um, the unexpected cycnia moth, which 
moths don't get all the credit uh, that they deserve. They're just, they're not as cute, I guess. But the unexpected Cycnea is a wonderful moth, a beautiful caterpillar, very hairy, very charismatic. Uh, it also needs milkweed and it relies on it completely for uh, its survival. And the queen butterfly actually also needs milkweed. And the queen is quite a bit larger than your average monarch. Um, it's a really stunning butterfly, but without milkweed, um, all of the flowers in the world won't matter because if it doesn't have this one host plant to lay its eggs on, um, it cannot reproduce. So there are a lot of milkweeds to choose from. It's not just that one tall weedy one um, that you see in the corner of the screen here with that butterfly on. That is common milkweed. It's five feet tall. It is, it is weedy like its name, right? It, it reproduces very quickly by seed and they germinate and then it's everywhere. Um, and this is, this is honestly the favorite of, it tends to be the favorite of the monarch, I think because of the really big leaves. Um, but there are tons of other milkweeds to choose from that they will also eat and enjoy. For, for our purposes today, if you're looking at your front yard, the ones that are most appropriate is butterfly milkweed, that bright orange bloom. That one only gets about two and a half feet tall and it's a lot more tidy. It's less likely to spread and germinate by seed. It doesn't spread quickly by rhizome. It's pretty contained and it's pretty short. And a hugely undervalued one is horsetail milkweed, which is this very delicate one in the middle of the screen, the white one. Um, it's very short, really about a foot tall, a foot and a half. Delicate stems, needle-like foliage, uh, white flowers that are just, you know, they're not, they're kind of unassuming, but they're very, they're still very, um, they're almost succulent. You know, when you see a, a milkweed bloom, they have those really sort of juicy looking flowers. And this still has that. Um, but it's, it would be lovely in a front yard garden because it's not so tall and huge and weedy in the eyes of a passerby. That one's called horsetail milkweed. So beyond milkweed, um, black swallowtails, right? That's a pretty common butterfly around here. But if they want to lay eggs and reproduce successfully, they need to have um, something in the carrot family or the parsley family. Um, so obviously dill, parsley, carrots, all of those can be predated by their caterpillars, but golden Alexander is a great plant. It can be a great front yard plant. Um, and we get tons of black swallowtail caterpillars on ours every year. And they usually come right before the plant sale and they eat every, they eat all of my golden Alexander in the greenhouse. And then it looks pretty bad when people come to buy it. But that's good. I, I don't stop them. I just let them eat and I hope they leave one for me to sell. And they always, they always pop up again from the root. So again, I just can't reiterate enough. It is okay for these caterpillars to feed on your plants. That's what the plants evolved to withstand. Um, so it's totally fine. They eat them down to sticks and then they come back better than ever the plant does. So it is not to fear, but golden Alexander is just a gorgeous plant. It has um, very kind of stemless, smooth uh, flower stalks. So they're great for cutting. I make a lot of bouquets and I really like them for making bouquets, but um, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're really variable, I guess. They can grow in pretty wet places, but they can also grow in pretty dry places. I've seen them in full sun, but I've also seen them in part shade. So they're a little bit like spiderwort. If you've ever grown spiderwort, you know, it kind of thrives anywhere. Golden Alexanders tend to do pretty well anywhere. So it's a great plant if you're not sure where to start and you're not sure what will survive, try some Golden Alexander. And so again, for, for birds, if, if you have the insect thing covered and you're not using pesticides and you have host plants and you're, you're inviting those invertebrates in, the next thing you can do is try to include plants that um, are gonna feed those uh, herbivorous birds or those birds that are um, not in breeding, right? They're maybe normally seed eaters and so they're not feeding anything to their young. You could have seeds, nuts, berries, and nectar, and the nectar would be for hummingbirds. So um, some of these would be appropriate for like the front of your house, like a corner planting, maybe by, by the corner of your house, looks like a large shrub, like a hazelnut. Um, hazelnut grows really well in Kansas, underplanted, 
it makes those beautiful. If you've never seen it, I should have included a picture, but if you've never seen a hazelnut in its seed pod, you're missing out. It's very ornamental, very fringed and um, just sort of globular. It's very cool. I like to use them dried in arrangements, um, but big beaked birds like those, blue jays, woodpeckers, um, anything with a big strong beak appreciates hazelnuts. Um, viburnums would be another one that you could use. They make a lot of berries and there's a viburnum for full sun. There's some that like shade. There's some that are 10 feet tall. There's some that are two feet tall. So that's another one that you can, you can find a species that is, that is right for your area. And um, they work really well in a variety of places and they produce those much needed berries that through the winter, robins, cedar waxwings, thrashers, um, that they really want through the late, late fall and winter as then some of them are migrating on. And of course seeds, echinacea is an easy one to put in. It's a little bit tall for like a front yard garden. Some of, some of the native varieties can get a little lank, um, but there are some good like angustifolia can be a little bit shorter sometimes. Um, and bluebirds and goldfinches really appreciate an echinacea snack, especially in winter when everything else is scarce. I see tons of goldfinches coming through, sitting on top of those echinacea seed heads and just ripping out the seeds and really having lunch. Um, so thinking carefully about what are the plants that you're choosing for your design? What are they doing besides looking good? Are they producing something that is worth eating, right? For the, the, the critters in your area. And nectar. So everybody loves hummingbirds. They're sort of uh, the universally loved bird. Unfortunately, in Kansas, we really only have two types that you're that you're likely to see, and that is a ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, that's the common one that that migrates through, especially in the fall. I see those, and you, you may see a broad-tailed hummingbird. And if you live in far western Kansas, you may be lucky enough to catch a rufous hummingbird that would be traveling through Colorado, but it would be pretty rare and you'd be pretty lucky. Um, but really any tube shaped flower is gonna provide that nectar for hummingbirds. And I say any, as in, if it's a sterile type, if it's over hybridized, if it's like a tropical annual that has been over hybridized, so it's like a double bloom and the hummingbird can't get into the tube, you wanna avoid those. But um, especially because hummingbirds do migrate from the tropics this is a time where it's okay to have some cannas you know or it's okay to have some nifofia that's all right because that's something that they would have had down there so if you want to have those fun annuals um, those tropical looking annuals maybe just choose some that can be of service to hummingbirds when they come through in the fall but also monarda our native monarda it's a hummingbird magnet and like penstemon grandiflorus and digitalis they have those kind of droopy tube shaped blooms that are attractive to hummingbirds, especially the few that come through in the spring. And even Agastache, which is known as hummingbird mint. That's a great obvious one to choose. Um, Blue boa tends to be the most hardy. I've tried the raspberry summer, tried some of the other pink ones. Blue boa tends to come back every year really good. Morello is a pinkish dusky rose one. That one has a pretty good track record too. Um, some of the orange ones, you know, I treat them more like annuals, but yeah. And lastly, major wheeler, which is a, a honeysuckle. It's a honey, it's Lonicera sempervirens. It's not the Japanese honeysuckle that can be really aggressive and take over. It's a lot more tame and um, grows really well. We have tons of hummingbirds that swarm that uh, late summer when it is in bloom on our gazebo and it's really a sight. So if you have a place for a vine, that would be a great option. So let's talk about just a few plant selection, plant choices. Now, if you plan to, and I hope I hope you all do plan to come to uh, Flora, Kansas, which is happening in late April, April 22 through 26, 22 for members only, and 23 through 26 for everyone else, you will see all of these plants I'm talking about and many, many more. We have hundreds of choices in there. So I'm just gonna give you some basics, right? What you need in your front yard, native planting, you need to cover the ground because if you don't cover it, the weeds will. So I'm a big proponent of um, dense plantings. 
plant dense because weeds cover ground. That's what they do. Plants are going to cover it. And I want to choose what plants they are. So you have to have a ground cover. I always suggest a grass or some type of sedge for texture because you need a change from broadleaf, you need some texture. And then you need some specimen plants or some color plants, right? Some mass plantings of, of color, taller um, options. So those are the three things we're gonna talk about really quickly. Here are two options for shade or part shade. Um, there is actually a sedum for shade and it's sedum ternatum. This is, this is sort of an Ozark and woodland succulent plant. It's very interesting and it has these very darling white blooms. Um, or you could go with woodruff. Um, some people say they have really good luck. Other people say it doesn't spread at all. So I think it highly depends on your soil. And I'm thinking in deep clay soil, it might be kind of hard for this to get going. Um, but woodruff smells really nice. They used to stuff beds with it. I think that's why they call it, um, that's why it's woodruff. Um, but it has a nice little smell and it's really short about four inches. And so it's a nice ground cover if you have a shady situation under a tree, maybe in your front yard. Plumbago is a great one for, for shade. It can, it can do quite a bit of sun. Um, and the more sun it gets, the more blooms it has on it, but it's also quite shade tolerant. Um, and it creates just this bluish dark green carpet. And in the fall, it's very colorful, red foliage, just a carpet of red. Um, so it does have two seasons of interest there. And barren strawberry, it's um, phragoides actually, or phragonoides is the Usually what strawberries are classified as, this is different. This is not part of that family, but very closely related. It has yellow flowers and you see it climbing here on the rocks, very short, maybe just four or five inches or less. And it creeps along the ground like strawberries are on runners. So it's a nice spreader if you have shade part shade. If you have sun like I do, burning sun for most of the day in your front yard, Maybe think of rock pink. This is a Western Kansas front range species um, that is very drought tolerant and it has succulent needle like leaves. Very interesting. And the flowers are on leafless stems. So it's kind of like a cactus and a sedum had a love child and it's this. Um, so it doesn't have spikes, but it does have kind of a cactusy flower. Um, and it seeds out and so it does spread and make clumps, which I really appreciate in my front yard. I want it to, to fill in. So it's a nice fill in plant. And rose verbena, this one is, um, it spreads, it kind of creates a dense carpet, but it also, sometimes it'll die out over here and then come up over here. It kind of moves around, which I think some people despise because they can't count on it. They think plants are like furniture and you just put your couch there and it'll stay but plants are not like furniture. And so um, it's much better to just embrace the fact that there's going to be change and the gardens are dynamic and they're gonna look different year to year. And so rose verbena is really good for reminding you that because it tends to creep around the garden, but it's nice and low growing and can take a lot of sun. Um, so the one, the non-native that I have in here is um, gray Santolina. I have so much love for this plant. I put it in all of my presentations. It's low growing, it smells amazing, smells very sagey and medicinal. It puts on these button-like blooms that pollinators really like, and it takes almost no water. I mean, so little water. It's very hardy, drought tolerant, poor soil, loves it. So it's, we have a big specimen plant of this out front of the Arboretum Visitor Center. If you have a chance, take a look, she's a beauty. And it's a great one to add to your front yard. And then Perky Sue, I mean, cute name, cute plant, very low growing, little daisies. And it does kind of creep along on these woody stems that then sometimes root in. So it creates its own little clump and it's wonderful mixed in with grasses. So this would be full sun, hot. These plants really thrive in that situation. Um, so if you have figured out your ground cover, you wanna add some grass. If you have sun, I would suggest true grass. Um, there's lots of options, but as I have mentioned several times, I like to keep it short. I think shorter is better in the front yard. The one rule of thumb for just any planting, any new bed you're putting in is you your tallest plant should never be taller than half the width of your bed. So if, you if your bed is an eight by eight square, it's eight feet across, 
the tallest thing you should have should be at max four feet. Because otherwise, it starts to dwarf your bed, right? Your plant starts to look like it's going to outgrow its space. So you want to keep it looking tidy. For your front yard, I say cut that in half. So if you have an eight foot bed, maybe the tallest thing should be two feet, two and a half feet, because shorter tends to appear tidier. Even if it's not weeded, even if it's messy and unorganized, if it's short, it will appear a lot more acceptable to the people walking by, to your homeowners association. It will seem like it's at least part of the norm of a mown lawn, of a short uh, something in front of the house. And also it practically, for practicality's sake, keeping it short helps people see your house number, helps you see out your, your home for security. You just don't want tall things out there. Prairie drop seed is a grass that fits that bill. It grows really only about 20 inches. The seed heads can come up quite high, but they're so airy that you don't notice them as part of the overall height. So they like full sun. They're a clump former. Prairie drop seed is the grass. I mean, I put it in almost every landscape because it's such a good performer and it's a beautiful grass and it actually weirdly has a nice smell you don't think of grass as having a nice smell but it does <laughs> the seed head has a really sweet smell and it's hard to explain so all I can say is midsummer come to the arboretum and smell this grass uh, when it's blooming it's lovely if you have shade like you have a big shade tree in your front yard um, and you're trying to fill in lawn sedge. Sedge is the way to go. So there's a whole host of sedges um, in the Carex genus, right? And they're all so hard to tell apart and they all have different preferences. Some of them love it wet, others love it dry. Some of them spread by seed, others stay in a clump. Um, and we usually have a pretty good selection of anywhere from six to 10 different sedges to choose from at Flora, Kansas. So if you come, just tell us your situation. Oh, hello, kitty. Um, just tell us your situation and we can help you find the sedge that's right for you. Um, but this one I'm showing here, I think is Carex Pennsylvania, and it has a really nice kind of um, meadowy type look. It kind of lays over and looks billowy and looks very much like a like a fen, you know, from a from a story. So that's a great sedge, but there's so many good ones to choose from. You really just have to think about your site. Is it dry? Is it wet? Um, is the soil sandy or loamy, those types of things will really help you pinpoint the right sedge for you. But you gotta have a grass in there, I think, um, design-wise to change up the texture. Otherwise it just looks like too many broadleaf plants. And then a few of your, what I would call your color, more showy specimen plants or cluster plants. Um, these would do for any of that. Pycnanthemum, I know it's white and a lot of people don't think that white flowers are showy. I don't have enough good things to say about this plant. It grows in almost any conditions. It's drought tolerant. Once it's established, just don't, don't worry about it. I mean, it just goes very little water and pollinators absolutely go bananas. They will choose pycnanthemum, these mountain, this is mountain mint. Um, they will choose mountain mint over almost anything else I have in the nursery. They just love it. And I think it's because each flower head has hundreds of flowers within it. So a bee can land on that flower and just stick his tongue in all of these different flowers rather than flying from place to place. That, that may be why. But and the foliage smells so minty and lovely when you brush by it. It's a great plant. Um, there's some bigger ones like Pnanthema muticum that gets a little bit taller, more like three and four feet. I would not suggest that one for a front yard if you're trying to keep it short. But flexuosum or tenuifolium, which have an impossible time keeping apart, they can be quite short if it's full sun and dry. If you water it a lot, it'll shoot up and get floppy. So um, that one's good for a dry, dry situation. Amsonia, there's lots of wonderful Amsonias. I like blue ice for front yards because it's short. Again, focusing on keeping it looking short and tidy. Blue ice maximum is 10 inch inches tall, but it has all those lovely attributes that Amsonia has. Spring flowers that are blue, really that, that icy blue color um, with, the, with a deeper blue tube behind for the contrast. And then fall foliage color. It always turns this lovely golden buttery hue in the fall. So it's got two season, seasons of interest, which is a big plus if you're planting something right out front of your house, you do want it to be showy. 
Delia, um, this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is prairie clover, white and purple prairie clover. Again, the foliage is scented. I'm a pretty sensory person in the garden, so I love anything that's going to emit a nice smell when I'm interacting with it. Um, and the foliage has a really pleasant smell on this clover. And it's a long lasting cut flower, which I use a lot. I like to cut a few and bring them in. And this, it's so vibrant. But also you see how many flowers are in one head. That one flower head just has hundreds of individual little tubelets. And that's another pollinator magnet. Butterflies just go down and they put their tongue in each one and it's very fun to watch. So this is a good one uh, for clustering. One on its own doesn't make a huge impact, but three together, three or four or five, really is showy when they bloom. Uh, Penstemon, Penstemon Dark Towers in particular is just a tried and true landscape plant. And there's a reason. Sometimes I think, oh, this one, you know, something's overplanted. But there's a reason why this one is overplanted, and it's because it performs and it doesn't flop over, and the leaf color is beautiful, and it is going to bloom year after year after year with very little water. Um, so those are all great reasons to put it in your front yard if you want something that's going to reliably look good and show off your porch or your brick or you know whatever dark towers looks lovely now i also love the straight penstemon digitalis which is sort of the the parentage of dark towers long ago um, it's a little bit more diminutive it's probably only maybe a <clears throat> foot and a half tall where dark towers can be up can be a little bit taller and i would say dark towers is one of your specimen plants you know you put one or two in an area and let it shine on its own while it's surrounded by ground cover and more filler plants. Um, but P. digitalis, just the, the straight penstemon, um, it's white, so it can kind of go anywhere and it's more likely to seed out. And so once you have one, next year you may have one over here and one over there and they're very airy and they're much less assuming than the cultivated variety. And so I love to let them spread, just let them go where they go. And then once the bloom is done, the foliage is just basal, very close to the ground and you kind of forget you have it until next spring. So that one's a lovely one too. I love dark towers if you want something really, really reliable that stays in the same place. But Pensamon digitalis on its own has, has some beautiful characteristics about it. Uh, Missouri Black Eyed Susan, um, this one is a summer bloomer and I'm kind of going in bloom chronological order, I just noticed, but this one's going to be mid midsummer when other things are sort of languishing and the spring flowers are long gone and everything else is hot. This one comes up and is very ready to take the heat, but most Black Eyed Susans are too tall and honestly too much of a bully in the garden for your front yard. Don't try Rubecchia triloba it'll take over. I've, I've made this mistake. But Black Eyed Susan uh, Rudbeckia Missouriensis, much smaller, much less likely to seed out everywhere. It will seed, but not as aggressively. And um, the seed heads through the winter are gorgeous. I was lucky enough to do the um, inaugural flowers for Laura Kelly's inauguration, our governor's inauguration, a couple of years ago with um, a florist out of Lawrence, we work together. Um, the uh, Blue Morning Glory is her floristry name. And we used these seed heads in that. And we got so many compliments, people saying, what are those interesting black balls you put in there? And they were just your average Rebecca seed heads, seed Rebecca Missouriensis. So that winter interest is really important uh, to think about too, when you're choosing plants for your design. And Liatris. Now, most liatris is too tall, um, in my opinion, for your front yard, depending on how close you are to the street and how much front yard you have. But a lot of them can get tall, three and four and five feet. But um, liatris punctata, which is one of the latest of the bloomers, that one can be really only about two feet, you know, sometimes 18 inches. It tends to be a lot lower growing and kind of growing out rather than straight up. Um, so I love punctata for front yards. That's nice. Spicata, um, depending on the, how much water it gets, can also stay relatively short. Um, so just be aware. I love liatris. You can't beat it for, you know, pollinator impact and that vibrant purple color mixed with some yellow. It's a showstopper. 
but sometimes they can get quite tall and quite floppy if you don't have tall grasses around them to hold them up. So if you're gonna go tall, you have to have a pretty big yard because you need then tall grasses around them. So spicata, punctata, those are some shorter ones. Some years we have um, liatris, small headed liatris. I think that's microcephala. And that one's also a nice one, um, stays a little bit shorter. And we're getting to the end of the season here uh, when asters come in, right? Was this sort of uh, late September, October. Um, and I even had this, this October sky species. I took a video of myself and I remember it was on election day. It was November 4 or November. Yeah, it's in November and these things were blooming strong. So they can last well into November for that season long color. And to me, asters are way better than planting mums because they give you longer season of color. They don't unhybridize and, and you know, like lose their double bloom or whatever they were supposed to have. And they're way hardier. They don't shrink every year. Um, and they just have such nice foliage, I think better foliage throughout the growing season. Mums don't do much for me through the growing season. They don't look like anything. But October skies, 12 to 24 inches tall. It's a winner. I can't say enough good stuff about this plant. It's great along a curb. Um, the other aster is too, but I love these asters kind of spilling over your edging. Um, I know I said clean lines and I'm standing by it, but having something spill over here and there adds some cottage garden feeling, some whimsy. Um, so, and snow flurry is basically has all those qualities, incredibly drought tolerant, incredibly drought tolerant and can take the heat of say a sidewalk or near a street. Um, but it, it also kind of cascades. Um, so it's really nice if you have it on a rock wall or on a curb, um, it cascades well and it stays very, very short ground hugging. I mean, snow flurry is eight inches tall max. It really stays in that one inch to six inch range. Um, but snow flurry is beautiful in the fall. It's just this, it looks like, it really does look like snow has piled up in the summer or in the late summer. Um, and just a tip about maintenance. Um, if you, if you plant native plants, um, you're planting a kind of a community, right? If you're planting things that are native to the Great Plains, you're bringing all of these plants back into sort of a historical community that they might have grown in, you know, or at least grown in the same hundred miles. If you throw in, um, say, a Japanese boxwood in the middle of that, um, that's fine. And I, like I said, I'm not a purist. I love a good uh, exotic plant, but um, if you have that boxwood in there, you have to maintain it differently than the plants around it. So beware and make it easy on yourself because you want this front yard space to be aesthetically pleasing. That means it has to be easy to maintain. And um, if, if everything else in your garden can say, just be mown down in the spring with a mower, except for this one over here and that exotic plant there and this one here because it's woody or something, well, then it gets harder to maintain. So make it easy on yourself and think about what natural plant communities would have looked like. And um, if you're gonna put in a specimen plant that is a non-native, maybe put it at the corner or at the front or at the back so that your maintenance routine can be easier and you're not trying to mow or burn or something around this one plant. And also, like I said, thick plantings mean less mulch. I have this photo example here because I feel like this is sort of the standard suburban idea. You want all your shrubs to be really tiny and really tightly um, cut into little balls or squares. And you want your flowers to be blooming from April through September, you know, and you want lots of space in between for mulch. And my you know, crazy ideas, all of that space for mulch is just space for weeds. So if you want to get away from this idea, just remember that mulch is great. I mulch a lot with free wood chips. Heavens, I don't pay for them. Just almost every city has a free wood chip pile. And anybody who tells you that like one type of tree mulch is better for the soil than another, maybe. I haven't seen it. We've been using free mulch at the Arboretum forever and our gardens look lovely. So Free mulch is great, use it, but remember that mulch is not meant to be forever and that the hope is that your plantings will grow together so that you have to mulch less and less um, because that open space is just space for weeds. And yeah, try not to mix in species that need 
too much special treatment because I think uh, later you will you will get frustrated with it. And if you're frustrated or not getting joy from your native front yard, um, it has a it has a good chance of being put back into lawn, and we don't want that. And this is a great picture from one of our school groups that I always show. I think this was a picture taken by Brad Gore of an enthusiastic student. Just know that you're going to weed. You're going to weed a lot. And there's this myth that goes around that native plants don't need a lot of work. And I just have bad news that it's not true. They do take a lot of work. I wouldn't be employed at the Arboretum if they were no work. Um, but they take a different kind of work. You're not fertilizing. You're not mowing all the time, you're not adding a bunch of chemicals, you're not pruning them all the time, but you are weeding and you are mulching and you are watering uh, when they get established um, to, to help them get established. Once they're older, the watering backs off significantly, um, but there is work. So just make sure you're carving out that time in your schedule because there's nothing more defeating and heartbreaking than when you spend money and time and love to put in a garden and then um, you're overcome by weeds. So just know. It's gonna happen, it's gonna get out of control, but if you keep on it, um, the next year won't be nearly as bad. And that is, I weed a lot. So I can tell you, honestly, it gets better. And in that vein, it won't look good right away. Um, this is actually my front yard last year, or yeah, two, fall, two falls ago. Um, it was really ugly, <laughs> it was really, really ugly. And my neighbors were like, what is she doing? It looks so bad. Um, but that's okay because now they walk by and they say, wow, this is so, you know, beautiful and interesting. And they may be lying to me, but, um, it does look, it's so much fuller and, you know, there's mulch and I've added rocks and I've added more plants and I've added bulbs, crocus and tulips. And so it's a labor of love. And so people get discouraged, but like anything, Rome wasn't built in a day, neither will your beautiful native front garden be. So just be patient. It's okay for it to look kind of sparse and, and scrappy for a while. And I end every presentation with a couple of slides about volunteering. I could not be here talking to you if I didn't have lovely volunteers today watering my greenhouse, giving me the time to do this, you know, and, and watering at the Arboretum and weeding and doing all those things. Um, and I think every staff person has jobs like that who, you know, we couldn't do what we do if we didn't have volunteers. So if you are in the area or passing by and you wanna be like these smiling people, look at them all, they're just thrilled um, and so happy. If you wanna be like them, just give us a call or email and we have lots of flexible schedule, um, fun opportunities for volunteers. We have uh, volunteer software that, that allows you to pick different job positions or opportunities. And sometimes you, you may wanna come once a week, once a month, once a year. We have all sorts of different options to help with an event or to help on a daily basis, whatever fits your schedule. And um, I work outside mainly with the mowing and the greenhouse and um, outdoor projects, but we also have um, a need for people in, at the front desk in the gift shop, helping us answer phones and field calls and uh, just be a smiling face to visitors. So if that seems like something that would be fulfilling to you, do reach out. We need you and we would be so appreciative. Um, so you can email or call or get in touch. And I end every uh, presentation with our mission statement because that is what I hoped to do today is to cultivate some type of transformative relationship between you people and the land. And I'm hoping always that our information about plants encourages you to get out and garden and get in touch with the land you live on.